All right, hi everyone. So thanks for coming for today's talk. So today, um, Professor Shun Qiang from University of Toronto uh, will give uh, the talk of his like current research, understanding the sample learning. Uh, the, the our first step. So let me back on from Chang. Chang is currently associate professor at uh, University of Toronto. Uh, he leads the STAT LE group, and uh, he work on many like challenging in the industrial sector. He's uh, interesting very broadly in deep learning, assembly learning, uh, generative AI, reinforced learning, etc. And he like uh, and makes several uh, foundational contribution to the field of statistics and uh, the, the deep learning. So now Chang take the, the floor. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, thank you Yuying, for the very nice introduction. So it's really an honor to speak here. Today I will talk about ensemble learning. Uh, this mm -hmm. is actually our first step to understand this. The the thing, so why I started to um, become very interested in ensemble learning is actually uh, recent in recent years we started to work with, uh, with industry. And some of the problem, for example, if you work on like a, you know, like a stock return prediction, or you work like a, uh, in like user growth team. Uh, if you want to build a very accurate prediction model, uh, ensemble learning seems to be the must go option. So we try to understand why ensemble learning works so well in practice. And uh, so, but mathematically, of course, we want we want to understand mathematically as well as you know in an like a practical. Um, advantages. So this talk is really a serious talk trying to understand why ensemble works, uh, specifically why bootstrap works, bootstrap ensemble works. And, uh, and this actually belongs to one of our very recent research program. We try to understand, for example, why some algorithms always outperform other similar optimal algorithms. You know, as a statistician, so we always try to prove, you know, a certain algorithm is optimal in certain regime, right? But there's always some algorithms such as random forest or boosting. They just work so well in practice and across multiple data sets, across different data sets. And we try to understand this uh, this phenomenon. I'll, I'll give you, you know, maybe some conjectured um, solution at the end of this talk. Now for this specific talk, I'll try to introduce everything from the deep learning perspective because we really talk, we will really talk about you know uh, assembling of uh, interpolators. So I start with a very simple, uh, even simpler thing, which is called the role of down sampling. Then I'll talk about the role ensemble. I'll talk about some reflections on adaptivity. The adaptivity of the algorithm. I think this is really the key. Uh, why some algorithm perform really well. Okay, so the introduction is very sort of very. You probably see this uh, in in many talks, especially in many theoretical uh, deep learning talk. This really talks about you know the recent trends of growing your model like larger and larger. Now when when the model has more and more parameters, we see a clear trend where you have better and better top one accuracy, right? And now, for example, now GP4, which is even bigger, which is a, like a pre-trained model, which is even bigger. Then there's always this, uh, this seems to be like a contrast. It seems, seems to, to refute to the classical regime, to classical statistical wisdom, where in, a, in classical statistics, or uh, in classical statistical learning courses, uh, we have something like this, right? As when you start to grow your model complexity, or when you start to grow the size of your models, well, the training risk, which is the dash dash lines, the training risk always decreases, right? Until you 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 perfectly fit the training data set, which is called interpolation. But the test risk, it first goes down and then goes up, right? Because uh, at first you have like model, uh, model you have model bars, and when when you grow your capacity to a certain level, your model starts to overfit the training data set, so it has bad 
test error. So in in the classical uh regime or in the classical classical statistical wisdom, there's always a sweet spot which balance this underfitting and overfitting. But now what we have observed uh, in, in modern machine learning is that after so you start to you start you you, 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 you still start to grow your uh, the, the model size. And after a certain threshold, the threshold is the interpolation threshold. So after your model starts to perfectly fit your training data set, then you start to see this test rate starts to drop down again. And as some and in some cases, uh, the test risk in this um, in this overprintrial regime can can be even smaller than the period period space bout. Okay, so this uh, this is phenomenon is reported in 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 Belkin's paper, reconciling modern machine learning practice and the classical bias variance trade off. And uh, so this phenomenon is observed in practice on random forest and also random features random features models. Later, we will also observe exactly the similar phenomenon, exactly the same phenomenon in neural network. So this paper is uh, 2020. Uh, 2020 paper called Deep Double Descent. Okay, so actually, uh, if you want to explain these things, uh, there's a conjecture back to 2015 from the optimization perspective. Because apparently you can, not all interpolated estimators, because in the over regime, all estimators are interpolated estimators, which means all estimators sort of perfect fit the training data. But you can construct easy counterexamples that there are some interpolated estimators cannot general as well. Right? And but in fact it seems those it seems that those estimators produced by say gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent they seem to generalize very well, especially stochastic gradient descent. Now in, in back in 2015, Nathan's group have uh, this conjecture that the stochastic gradient descent or uh, gradient descent induces, induces some implicit regularization that finds model with the low complexity or maybe the lowest complexity. Now this conjecture now has been verified in very simple cases. Uh, for example, one of the cases is the linear regression. They say people have shown that, you know, for gradient descent, <clears throat> Uh, the gradient descent actually starting from a region actually finds the minimum norm solution of the empirical risk. So basically, for linear estimator, this means, for example, your training data set, the, this estimator exactly interpolates the training data set, which means you have exactly y equals to xi transpose beta right, for linear regression. But the gradient descent will actually find the minimum the finds the estimator with the minimum L2 now among all interpolators. Okay, so you can actually have a very simple um, proof to this. And the proof here I'm giving is uh, is actually taken from at least 2022 AI stats paper. So for example, if we consider just minimizing the least square loss here, Right, and the gradient descent for, for minimizing this least square loss um, has the following update. Right, and here eta is the learning rate of the step size. Now, if I if I take eta goes to zero, which means I will look at this uh, gradient descent uh, from the continuous time perspective. So the corresponding gradient flow is the following has the following form which actually is a uh, admits uh, like an uh, ordinary differential equation form. Now, if you take like ODE course, you can, you can solve this very uh, easily, right? So basically you can, you can get exact, you can get the exact solution to this uh, ODE. So, so here I just gave you, give you this uh, exact solution. So the gradient flow estimator at time t when starting from zero, uh, admits the following exact solution. 
Okay, so basically here at transpose x, we have a plus in the in the upper right, which is means the pseudo inverse. And then I have some, then in the middle I have a identity matrix minus exponential minus t at transpose x over n. So this is actually some sort of a shrinkage term. Then I have x transpose y, right? If I just ignore the middle term, this is exactly the the least square term, the the, the order least square estimator in the uh, if 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 my sample size is larger than the dimensionality. Okay, and this also corresponding to t goes to infinity. If I ask my time goes to infinity, if I run this uh, axiom forever, then my gradient flow estimator actually takes the following form. Oh, this is called the Ridgeless estimator. This is exactly the minimum L2 norm solution in the over parameterized regime. In the under parameterized regime, this actually corresponds to the order least square estimator. Okay, so you can you can prove this by using a simple linear algebra. Now, previously, this is actually about uh, gradient descent. Right, for stochastic gradient descent, um, we have very similar uh, result because for stochastic gradient descent, you have you you will have an additional term which is corresponding to the noise. Okay, but if you again if you send the step set or you you send the step sets goes go to zero, the continuous version follows the uh, stochastic modified equation. So if I, so you have actual term corresponding to the noise, which is actually a higher order term because. For this term, you have additional factor square root eta in front of uh, the sigma dBt. Okay, so when eta goes to zero, this term also goes to zero, which means actually stochastic gradient descent and gradient descent they are qualitative, qualitatively the same. If you if you have very small learning rate, now if you have large learning rate, you will have uh, different things, right? For example, you will achieve directional convergence uh, for gradient descent. Which gave you slightly better generalization error. Sorry, may I ask a question? Yeah, so, sure. So the conclusion that you made for the gradient descent and the stochastic gradient is almost same. In is there like a dimension dependent, or it's for all the dimensions? This is uh, this yeah. This is actually for this is for all the all the dimensions if you fix the dimension if you ask it goes to zero then this works for all, all fixed dimensions gotcha. but if you also grow yeah if you also grow dimensionality then, then you, you probably need to consider how fast you send this it goes to zero that's a very different problem yeah thanks you're welcome okay so so we are really interested in the statistical series, right? Uh, now for this minimum norm estimators in the linear case, we already know stochastic gradient descent convergence to this uh, ridgeless estimator. In the under parameter regime, it is exactly the alternate least square estimator. In the over parameter regime, it is a minimum norm solution. Now back in 2022, uh, he say, at all has a paper basically characterize the exact risk of uh, this high dimensional ridgeless this square interpolations interpolators. So they analyze the test risk. Now specifically the test risk risk here is the auto sample prediction risk. So which means if I have a new data set coming which is x new, then I just use beta hat to do the prediction. So how far is this the prediction away? On the true label x new transpose beta. So here beta a beta is a true model generating parameter. Okay, so here uh, we're just going to focus on the simplest case, right? We're going to focus on linear regression model, and then xi and epsilon i, they're just uh, normal distributions with aso with isotropic covariance. And epsilon i is also Gaussian distributed with uh, noise level sigma square, okay? I'm going to, we're going to uh, characterize the risk in the proportional asymptotic regime. 
which means the dimensionality grows linearly with the sample size n here. Okay, now in this case, this auto sample prediction risk has the following limit. Okay, so this, uh, for example, in the under primary regime, you only have a variance term. For the over primary regime, you have two terms. The first term is R squared times one minus one over gamma. This is actually the implicit bias term. The second term is the variance term. So the risk, uh, if, if you find this uh, equation a little bit uh, complicated, you can just look at the figure in the left in the left panel. Okay, so basically you have this the test rate first increases until your gamma is one. So gamma gamma is equal to one, which means d the dimensionality is the same as the sample size. This is exactly the point your model starts to. Uh, perfectly fits the training data set. Okay, then after this interpolation threshold, the test rate starts to drop again. Now here, actually, we we simplify the setting, right? We, we we always assume this. We assume a moving model, so you don't really have a, a like a model bias in the underparameter regime. Okay, this is just to simplify the setting. But okay, so many people actually care about you know care about uh, what the test risk look like and try to recover the double descent. Now here, there's the what we look at how we look at this uh, this uh, test risk is that we identify, for example, at least around the uh, interpolation threshold, um, the risk, the test risk is unbound is unbounded, right? So the test risk uh, and it's, it is unbounded because the variance really explode at this point. So we, we, we start to think about, you know, in addition to understanding this double descent, what can you do to mitigate this? Now, well, one wheel we have is that, um, because in, in, in the deep learning we have, is actually increasing the model size is equivalent to down sampling, okay. Now in the deep learning literature, when people people often do is they try to do try to grow the model bigger and bigger, right? They try to overprint as a model. So you can get a bigger model, so you can do better approximation, and you can have well controlled uh, variance because you are you're now in the actually in the overprint regime, right? You are far away from the interpolation threshold. So you have well controlled implicit bias as well as well controlled variance. But if you if you look at this, right, if you by growing the model sets here, at least in the in, in this linear model, you are actually growing this gamma here because gamma is d over n. Okay. So this gamma, uh, I'm going to give give it a name just for simplicity. This gamma, which is defined as uh, d over n or as the limit of d over n, is called x by ratio in random matrix theory literature. So when you grow in this dimensionality, when you grow the model size, which means you're growing the dimensionality here, you're actually growing gamma. Now this is equivalent to reducing sample size, right? Because when you're growing D, it's equivalent to, um, um, recurrent to making this sample size smaller. In both ways, you can, you can grow this gamma. So, so we have this, uh, you know, hypothesis. We think that you know, down sampling is exactly as uh, has exactly the same role as uh, as increasing the model size as over parameterization. So we start, we, we then we start to study this uh, the effect of down sampling. Now here we're going to study this random sketching, right? Uh, random sketching is basically try to sketch uh, your big data set into a smaller data set. But using a random weighting matrix S, where S is uh, you know n by n matrix. Okay, so basically, what you do if you just uh, if you just multiply these I's on your data set, which is Y and X, then you try to and then you try to fit this uh, linear regression again, right? And for this linear regression, basically, you are just reducing the sample sets from n to n. M is more than n, so you have a reduced uh, 
uh, you have a smaller effective sample size. Okay, so in most of previous works, uh, people actually uh, study the, the time complexity for sketching. Uh, for example, in Plancy's uh, 2016, 2016 uh, thesis, which consists of a couple of papers, a sequence of papers, they study, for example, how many times you can see by using, by using different uh, sketching matrix. If, us, if every entry of, of us is Gaussian, then you have the following complexity, which is roughly the time complexity is roughly NDM plus MD square. And the most, and the most uh, efficient way is actually something called orthogonal sketching, where each row of us, uh, so the rows of us are actually orthogonal to each other. So for now, for for this orthogonal sketching, the time compact the time complexity is roughly n d log m. Okay, at least the, the first term is n d log m. The leading term is n d log m. So you have even more reduction here. So we're going to focus on this uh, orthogonal sketching because it saves more computationally. Okay, so as we have just mentioned, right? If you have a, if I have, if you sketch, uh, if you use the random sketching to sketch the data set, what really changes is the effective sample size from n to n. Now, in terms of risk, what really changes is that you are actually moving your aspect ratio gamma to a new aspect ratio gamma nu, which is uh, larger than the original one. Okay. Now let's look at uh, two cases. Now, for example, uh, when when gamma is around one, and when your SNR, the signal to noise ratio is larger than one, then you can find an M star, which is smaller than the sample size N, which achieves the minimal risk, which corresponding to the, the purple arrow I have here. So basically I'm effectively moving the point, which is uh, left to the into interpolation threshold to the to the to the right you can achieve a smaller risk test risk right when gamma is very when gamma is not so small but when the signal to the ratio is very small then you can actually show uh, this uh m star is much much smaller than the sample size and achieves a minimal risk actually this case corresponding to the non s meter basically you have to set this if you set this beta Let's say you, if you set this beta hat to be zero, you can achieve a better risk than a minimum norm estimator. This because in this case you actually the signal to ratio is just too small, so you cannot do better than the non estimator for this uh for this uh, minimum norm estimator. Okay, so now assuming uh, I'm going to pick a very good sketching size every time, right? Then I, I can actually reduce the risk of the minimum estimator from the blue curve to the red curve, okay? Now, these two, this two, uh, this, this two figures are actually corresponding to different cases, uh, which is described by the signal to noise ratios. But you can see the purple regions here is actually the region where you can effectively reduce the test risk of the original minimum norm estimator by using sketching. Here we use orthogonal sketching. So the conclusion is actually sort of very also, uh, is also on the contrary to the uh, classical statistical wisdom, where we have this larger sample size does not necessarily mean better, better accuracy. Okay, we also have a very interesting observation, uh, which actually tells you apart, tells this orthogonal sketching and this Gaussian sketching apart. So previously we already know that Pilancy's thesis, we already know orthogonal sketching is uh, strictly better than Gaussian sketching in terms of time complexity. But here, what we try to tell you is actually orthogonal sketching is also better than Gaussian sketching in in terms of generalization, in terms of statistical generalization, generalization, okay. 
So here, the blue curve corresponding to the test risk for orthogonal sketching and uh, the, the, the green curve corresponding to the uh, auto sample prediction, prediction risk for the ID sketching, which is the general form of Gaussian, uh, Gaussian sketching. So you can tell in the overprint regime, these two test risks, they overlap, they coincide. But in the underprint regime, the orthogonal sketching is always better than the Gaussian sketching. Okay, so um, but there's only one uh, one sort of uh, problem uh, I'm not really satisfied. Is that sketching from, again, from a statistical point of view, uh, it's not really that efficient, right? Because it does not really use all the operations. So what, what do we do with the rest of the operations? Right? It seems to be a waste. I mean, from the completion perspective, we can understand you want to save some running time, run time for the algorithm. But from statistical perspective, I always want, you know, utilize all the data set I have, right? So it can be efficient. Okay, uh, here um, we, we, we're going to study this um, from a first, from a very simple um, setting. Because we have previously, we have noticed that when the data are too noisy, um, you know, you can set this M star, which is optimal sketching size to be much less than the sample size of the of this D is in typo. Okay, so how about, uh, so a natural idea we have at first is that how about we use just, we, we use one sample estimator and we try to ensemble everything together. Does it, does it help? Okay, so it's simple as this, right? So every time we're going to fit one sample estimator, then we try to average everything together. Okay. Also, for this case, I also need the eta in front of this size meter, which is actually a correction coefficient. So this is just a simple average of one sample minimum as meters. And the setting is roughly the same as before, but we can calculate the auto sample prediction risk. Now, it exactly as this form, this is one minus one over gamma times one plus sigma square plus one. Okay. So by directly looking at this, if we have two conclusions. The first conclusion is that first, if if my gamma goes to zero, then this risk also goes to zero. So I have consistency in the in the classical asymptotic regime, which means for example, if I fix my dimensionality D, if I send my sample size goes to infinity, I still have consistency. Another direct consequence we can see is that is that actually this uh, auto sample prediction risk is always bounded because it's one minus something, right? Now we can tell how this uh, uh, how it look like by you know by plot this theoretical uh, test risk curve. Okay, so in the noiseless case, right? In the noiseless case, uh, the blue but this is actually how the test risk um, behave. And the blue curve corresponds to the ensemble of one sample estimator. And the and the and the red curve corresponding to the minimum estimator. Okay. So in the in the noiseless case, which means actually I don't really have any noise, additive noise, which means my sigma square equal to zero. Then my minimum estimator when gamma is smaller than one, my minimum estimator is the ordinary square estimator, right? It perfectly fits the data because you have no noise, right? It always gives you uh, exact prediction, which means actually my test risk is always zero. Now, when, when in the overprint hygiene, uh, then, my, then my test risk starts to rise. My, my ensemble somehow, uh, so the risk corresponding to ensemble one sample uh, one sample estimators is much smoother, but it's strictly worse than this one. But keep in mind, this is actually a noiseless case. Now, if I just increase my noise, 
for example, I just continue this increase my sigma square. This is how the test risk look like. Okay, so you can see when I continue to increase my uh, noise level, my ensemble, the, the test risk for the ensemble roughly keeps the same, right? It doesn't really change that much. But for the minimum norm estimator, um, it starts to behave very badly. And the gap starts to, you can see a lot of gap between these two risks. Okay, so um, you know, by, by studying this simple case, we know ensemble works for the weakest possible uh, least square estimators, which is one sample estimators. It seems to us that it smooths auto sample risk curve by, by reducing by reducing the variance because if we increase, we keep increasing the variance, the gap becomes larger. But actually, from a more uh, like a more like a finer uh, analysis, it is it is at least to our surprise that actually ensemble also help reduce uh, the bias sometimes. Okay, so we're going to actually study this uh, in a more general setting. Okay, we we just forget about the one sample uh, ensemble case. We're going to formulate this uh, more rigorously. So let's assume we have a sequence of uh, random variables, which follows Bernoulli distribution with sampling probability theta. So theta is a parameter in a Bernoulli uh, random variable. And then we can write, uh, we can write an estimated beta b hat in the following form. So this beta b hat is basically a weighted uh, least square loss. Because wib here is a Bernoulli random variable, right? It only takes one or zero. So this really means that I only pick a proportion of the original samples, right? And because W follows Bernoulli distribution with parameter theta, it means I roughly only utilize theta proportion of the original samples to form this uh, estimator beta b hat. Then I do this uh, simple average as an ensemble. Right? I try to, I just, I just uh, take an average of all the beta b hat. Okay, so beta b hat, this b should be in the subscript. Okay, so now fortunately for this uh, general program or for the for this uh, empirical risk minimization problem, for each of this beta b hat, we can write it as a, a sketch estimator actually. A sketching kernel corresponding to uh, to this Bernoulli weights takes a diagonal form, okay? So SB corresponding to, which is, you can take this SB, which is a sketching matrix to be diagonals. Uh, each diagonal is roughly, it's just the square root of WIB. Okay, the, the previous beta B hat can be written as a sketch estimator. So basically, so this ensemble is basically trying to averaging on um, this, uh, this uh, different uh, sketch estimator with sketching kernel consisting of diagonals of square root of the uh, Bernoulli weights. So we call this uh, the Bernoulli sketching matrix. Okay, so a lot of uh, you know a lot of the theoretical tools we established in the previous paper can be also utilized here to analyze the ensemble of linear interpolators here. But there's a significant challenges here is that actually here each beta beta b hat each beta sb each beta hat so each sketch each sketch as meters is not necessarily independent with other sketch as meters. So you have to take this uh, dependency into consideration. This actually creates a lot of problems technically. But this is uh, our, you know, auto sample prediction risk, assuming you can, you know, you can just uh, uh, overcome all the technical changes. This is the final auto sample prediction, prediction risk you have. Okay, so again, this is, uh, if you just look at the equations, this is probably less intuitive, but we can look at the figure. 
which which corresponding the equations we have. Okay, when when the sampling probability is one, right? Basically, this corresponding to minimum normalized standard, which means we actually use all the samples in each sketch estimator. Right? So so average sketch estimator is the same. So this corresponds to the minimum norm estimator. So you can see the yellow curve is exactly as before. It's exactly as the uh, is the same as the minimum norm estimator. But when you have a smaller theta, okay, so when you have a smaller theta, you will see actually you have a smaller test risk. And moreover, this test risk, uh, they these two test risks, they never explode. Okay, so which means that you, you get much stabler test risk. So it generates much better. Now in linear case, in linear models, we know exactly where the interpolation threshold is, right? So we can always uh, we can always play smarter by avoiding this interpolation threshold. But think about in general cases, for example, for real data analysis, if I use complicated models such as random voice, boosting, or even neural networks, I would never know where the interpolation threshold is. Right? And, and I tend to, for example, I trained uh, I train the data set, I train my model using the past data set. And I try to predict, for example, in, in stock return prediction, I try to always predict tomorrow's return. Now remember the the, the market always shifts and the, the data generating mechanism continues to to shift every day or even every minute. So it's not really guaranteed the model always, if you use a single estimator, but it's not always guaranteed this single, this individual estimator that gives you the best performance. It's not necessarily consistent. Now, if you by chance, if you hit somewhere at the interpolation threshold, your risk is going to explode. So you're going to actually, um, you're going to lose a lot of money if you're doing real trading. But ensemble learnings, somehow always give you a stable risk. You're never going to lose that much. When you can, when you can earn money, when you can make profit from the market, you can, but when you cannot, you're not going to lose a lot. So this is the message we're trying to send. Uh, you, you actually, in practice, if you work with, uh, with this industry, most of the times, if you want to build a system, you want your system to perform to, to stably. Right. So you not necessarily always want it to have optimal performance in a certain point, but as long as you can perform stably and you can, as long as it works well, uh, it's good most of the times. Okay, so this is actually the Bernoulli bootstrap um, because in the bootstrap, we're actually using Bernoulli weights, but there's still a, a, something classical people use more often called bootstrap with replacement. Right, those are replacements actually corresponding to, I'm going to actually sample this case from multinomial distribution. And the corresponding uh, bootstrap kernel, classical bootstrap kernel corresponding to, again, is the diagonal matrix, which with each diagonal entry to be the square root of Ki, where Ki follows multinomial, dis multinomial distribution. And again, for this uh, bootstrap re re with replacement, you can write each individual estimator as a sketched estimator, right? Then the bootstrap estimator is basically by taking simple average of this sketched estimators. But you just have a different sketching kernel here. Okay, so the bootstrap with replacement, we can we can go on with the calculation. Actually, the calculation here is even harder because here um, I have a uh, repeated entries for the for the model. So it's even harder to analyze, but um, surprisingly, if you can calculate our sample prediction risk, it looks, looks exactly the same as the Bonoli bootstrap. Okay, the only difference here is actually you are taking this data, the sampling probability, to be exactly one minus one over E. 
Okay, so here the tempo, the E is just the Euler constant. So the bootstrap with replacement is, has a fixed sampling probability, which is one minus one over mm, the Euler constant E. Okay, <clears throat> so in other in other words, uh, in other words, this bootstrap with replacement is exactly the same as the Bernoulli bootstrap, statistically speaking. If you take the sampling probability in the Bernoulli, in the Bernoulli bootstrap to be one over one minus one over e, roughly zero point six. Okay. Um, so this is about bootstrap. I want to talk about actually some of this work. This line of work is motivated by uh, a previous paper by uh, Nordin Karoi. I'm going to get there. Okay. So when we teach our undergraduate students, at least uh, when I teach when I teach my undergraduate students on uh, statistical inference, I use book uh, by Larry Westman on statistics. So there's a session called bootstrap. Usually in statistics, we use bootstrap for, you know, for estimating, for, for actually for inference. We try to estimate the variance. Then we can construct the confidence intervals. We can calculate the p-values. So this is all for inference, okay? And Nordin has a paper, Nordin and uh, Elizabeth have a paper called, can we trust bootstrap in high dimensions? And you can get, you can, you can take a guess what is the answer to this question. And the answer is actually no. Uh, so they basically point out there's no sort of universal bootstrap techniques that you can do in inference. Okay. Now with hindsight, with hindsight, I actually agree with that. Uh, this is actually very intuitive. Their 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 conclusion, although technically, although very technical. Now think about, for example, if. Of course, they only consider the under primary gene because in the over primary gene, the beta hat is not even identifiable because there are, there are multiple betas that correspond to the same prediction. But even in the over primary regime, right, when you start to grow your sample, when you start to grow your model sets by growing the dimensionality in linear regression, the system, the linear system quickly becomes unidentifiable in some sense. Right. If your beta is not even identifiable, why do you even care about estimating? Uh, why do you even care about estimating beta? Or even care about doing inference on beta? This does not really make make any sense to me. What really, what are really always identifiable is a prediction. So, so we think about uh, you know this bootstrap, uh, which is a bootstrap ensemble, which is a specific ensemble. Actually, just helps to stable the risk curves. Okay. Even in, in our you know in our prototype study, which only analyzed the one sample ensemble, or in our more rigorous study where we analyze the you know the Bonoli bootstrap or the bootstrap with the uh, replacement. In both cases, it just helps to stable the prediction risk. And uh, we have already talked about this before. So the classical bootstrap, which is a bootstrap with replacement, is equivalent to Bernoulli bootstrap with a certain sampling probability, at least statistically, right? Now, but Bernoulli bootstrap offers you more flexibility because it has a hyperparameter theta. It has a sampling probability. Here, I'm just going to give you all the answer. So theta is actually some sort of uh, hyperparameter that really controls some sort of implicit regularization. Now, if you have a smaller theta, then the ensemble, then the bootstrap ensemble is going to work better in this weak signal to noise ratio regimes. But you, you, if you have a larger theta, then it's going to work uh, work in strong signal to noise ratio regimes. And I'll come back to this signal to noise ratio later. But but uh, I'm actually going to uh, you know clarify one uh, of our previous uh, our previous uh, statement. Previously, I said that bootstrap also helps to reduce the bar, uh, reduce the bias. Okay, so let's do some comparison between bootstrap estimators versus individual estimators. 
So first, it helps you to achieve the variance reduction right? because this variance, uh, this variance ratio of the bootstrap estimator versus the individual estimator is always smaller than one. And more specifically, uh, moreover, actually, when theta goes to gamma, this variance ratio actually goes to zero. So you actually achieve the order of, order of magnitude difference. Now, usually, if we, we, if we take an average of many estimators, right, it does not really, it does not really reduce the bias because bias is the is a first order um, thing. So if you take the average, it won't really reduce the bias. It only only helps reduce the variance. But here, it does help to reduce the bias. Why is that? This is because the bias here is actually the impl impl implicit bias, right? Now remember how. How you how how this implicit bias actually occur? This is because the because the algorithm that the stochastic gradient descent actually introduces introduces some implicit regularization. So I'm actually using bias. I'm I'm actually sacrificing the bias to reduce the variance. But here, because the you know ensemble, the bootstrap ensemble estimator actually have a much better has much better stability. So I don't really need to sacrifice that much bias for reducing variance. So I also have a you know smaller implicit bias here. Okay, so here all the results uh, are actually under isotropic covariance matrix for the design matrix, for the design variables x. But actually under general covariance matrix, we have a qualitative qualitatively the same results. But you know the the impressions the the expressions for this uh, equations will be much more complicated and evolved, but roughly. But 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 the results are actually indicating the same things. Okay, so we're going to talk more about uh, signal to noise ratio regime or signal to noise ratios. Um, now remember the classical signal to noise ratio is defined as follows. Right, so it. Defined as beta star two norm square over sigma square. Beta star is a signal. Sigma is noise level. So this is exactly the signal to noise ratio. But actually, if you think more carefully, does this classical notion of this signal to noise ratio really characterize the signal to noise ratio in practice? I'm going to give you two cases. So the first case is so the, in the first case, I'm going to have this R square. R square is the beta two norm square. R square and sigma square equals to one one. But I'm going to have this D fixed. The dimensionality D is fixed. But I'm going to send the sample size goes to, to infinity. In the second case, I'm going to have exactly the same R square and sigma square, which means the classical notion of the, this SNR is still one. But I'm going to send both D and N goes to infinity. OK. So the consequences for these two cases is in the in the first case, we can consistently estimate beta star. This is what we learn in classical asymptotics, right? This is central limit theorem or model based central limit theorems. Or more simply, uh, this is a strong law of large numbers. But in the case two, because we are actually also sending this D, e, dimensionality goes to infinity, although we have the same signal. The R square equal to one, but each coordinate is actually diminishing. So which means we cannot this we cannot really estimate this beta star consistently. Right? So qualitatively, case two is much difficult problem. And it's actually corresponding to weak signal to noise ratio, although the classical SNR gives you the same value. But qualitatively, it's actually a much dif a much difficult problem. It corresponding to weak signal to noise ratio because each coordinate of this beta is diminishing. Okay, <clears throat> so now back to our back to our uh, auto sample prediction risk. Now remember, for a single or uh, for a single ordinary square estimator, which is an individual estimator, the the test risk explodes. Right now, the blue. The, the the blue curve is our back on the square estimator or the or the bootstrap ensemble estimator. Now 
in the classical asymptotic regime, you know, this bagging and uh, this individual estimator, they have the same risk, which is zero. Now, quantitative is also the same. It's roughly one over n, right? But in the inconsistent regime, which is characterized by this uh, proportional asymptotic regime, where d is not fixed, um, the bagging of the bootstrap ensemble is uh, much better than the individual estimator here. Now, here I'm just trying to think that actually this regime, this proportional asymptotic regime, is also a perfect, um, perfect uh, describes the you know the weak signal to normal ratio regimes. So if you think about, if you want to study something, whether some algorithm works in the weak signal to normal ratio regime, you you should study this uh, this theoretical regime, proportional asymptotic regime. So basically. This figure just tells you that you know the bootstrap ensemble not only works in the consistent regime, also gives you much stabler risks in the inconsistent regime. Okay, so this actually uh, this inconsistent regime is just the one case for the large sample regime. In the past, maybe in the past ten or twenty years, people uh, there's a lot of development in high dimensional statistics and high dimensional probability, so people focus on finite sample regime, right? Oracle inequalities, matter concentration, and these things. But I think it's also time to move to this to this uh, large sample regime again. And for this large sample regime, we actually have three different regimes. Uh, the first regime is uh, the classical asymptotic regime where these fixed are degrowed very slowly. This actually corresponds to the large SNR regime because you can estimate everything consistently. Now in the proportional asymptotic regime, where we started here is corresponding to the weak SNR regime. Now there is also another regime which uh, is uh, something we're working on right now. Uh, actually, corresponding to the super weak SNR. Sometimes you will have a phase transition in this regime. So sometimes you you can not do anything at all. Okay. Okay, so for the classical asymptotic regime, we have unified theory. This unified theorem is called empirical process theory. Okay, and all you know, the so inference from the foundations for the so inference is also established in this regime. But in this, in, in the latter two regime, the proportional asymptotic regime and the also log proportional regime, we don't really have unified theory. Okay. So maybe it's also time to you know to, to, to develop unified theorem for these regimes. What currently works are actually very specific uh, two boxes. And these two boxes only work on a, like a case-by-case -case setting. Not like the like the improved process theory, we have a standard two box. You just need to run the standard two box and fill everything in. You can you can analyze. Any MS meters, but for this, um, for this, uh, for this, uh, for this proportional asymptotic regime and this log proportional asymptotic regime, we only have very limited two boxes. One two box is the random matrix theory, which is which is what we heavily utilize in this work. It can only be used to characterize exact risk calculations for simple estimators. Here, simple estimators means we can only estimate estimators with closed form solutions. Now there are also another two boxes. Um, another two, another two boxes called Poisson massive passing, and also uh, convex Russian mean max theorem. It can analyze. They can analyze slightly more complex estimators, but still very restricted. Most of cases they are restricted to, for example, analyzing R one type regularized estimators. But when, but it can also deliver um, exactly the same results. For uh, for simple estimators, where RMT can analyze, so it actually gives you exact same similar same results as RMT does. Okay, so there are also other approaches, right? Uh, this approach, for example, of risk. This is uh, due to a paper by uh, Nathan's group, and uh, so the key idea in this optimistic risk uh, risk paper is that. Uh, they try to refine the complexity measure, which is used in the in the uniform law of less numbers because 
for example, uh, think about the classical uh, complex measure such as the VC dimension, right? VC dimension is a dimension that is a dimension, right? For binary linear classifiers, it is basically the dimensionality of the feature. So it's an integer. It cannot really take into account the mean norm property of the estimators. So, so you you definitely need some more refined complexity measure for analyzing, uh, you know, uh, this minimum norm estimators or even general more general estimators. But it it is hopeful that we can maybe push this this approach uh, to the more general case. Okay, so I'm going to finish my talk here. Uh, actually, there's a couple of takeaway messages. If you find the previous you know, slides are uh, too technical. So first is, uh, you know, uh, optimizing, optimization algorithm always induces some implicit regularization, which gives you mean norm solution. So basically searching the estimator with the smallest norm. And this search is actually, exactly gives you implicit regularization. The risk is sometimes not bad in the over regime because you are really sacrificed because the dominant term sometimes is a variance term. The variance is really exploding. And uh, at least in our case, in the linear system, uh, you can do two things. You can either over the system like deep learning does, or you can do down sampling. Down sampling is exactly the same as over parameterization in terms of statistical generalization properties. And ensemble, what, what, what does ensemble do is that ensemble gives you stabler risk curves. So, so risk is never exploding, right? So ensemble is much better than individual estimators when you have weak or super weak SNRs. I'm going to uh, try to answer some of the previous, uh, the, 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 the first slide, the first question I post in this talk. So why do some algorithms always outperform some other similar optimal algorithm? This is because when we try to analyze the optimality of some algorithm, we always confine ourselves ourselves in a specific regime, right? You know, we need this scaling condition, we need this asymptotic regime, we need everything performs very well. But you really want your algorithm to perform in multiple regimes. Now here Ensemble will give you a better estimator because it has this adaptivity to different signal to noise ratio regimes, right? It gives you consistent estimator in the in the classical asymptotic regime. It also gives you much stabler estimator in the proportional asymptotic regime, which corresponds to the weak signal to noise ratio regimes. You can also study, for example, you know, uh, algorithms from other perspective, maybe different different regimes, such as whether an algorithm can perform very well in a stochastic setting, or in the or whether it can also perform very well in the uh, the Vasaro case. This is called best of both worlds results in the you know in the RL literature. You can also study, for example, whether a certain algorithm can perform in the different case. Uh, the simplest, the, the simplest stationary case is the ID setting. You can also study, for example, whether certain algorithms can adapt to the non-stationarity by adapting, uh, by paying more attention to the local trend, recent local trends. For example, this could be more uh, critical in financial market, in, in characterizing financial market. Okay, so that's all. Uh, thank you. Okay. Great. Uh, great talk, Chang. So, any like a uh, uh, question from the audience? Okay, like Chang, like I ask you one thing. Like you do a lot of uh, industry thing, right? So this model is for linear. So the the down sampling is. Is that similar to the mini batch in the deep learning when they train the model? Is there a way to extend this one uh, beyond the linear setting? Uh, 
مثلا مینی بچ 